please join me in welcoming John Deutsch to the platform. Those uh, introductions become progressively uh, more painful the older one becomes. Um, I want to say how uh, pleased I am to be here for this conference, how much I've enjoyed it up to this very moment. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, um, I do want to uh, thank Mr. Moderator. I want to thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, I wanted to thank my friend uh, Enid Bach Oaken, who has been a uh, uh, Pat's and my hostess here this weekend. Gallantry prevents me from saying how long I've known her, uh, but it's been a long time. Uh, I also know that in this audience there are uh, many distinguished former officers of the Central Intelligence Agency. For example, uh, my distinguished friend John McGaffigan, and I want to say that uh, I hope they find my comments uh, of interest. Uh, I want to begin by uh, speaking about the expectations we have for uh, President Obama and the new administration. We are shifting our approach to foreign policy in this country from a period of what is, I guess, called American exceptionalism, where the approach was for the United States to decide what they wished to do and proceeded to do so in a firm uh, way. Uh, without uh, really generous uh, con uh, uh, consultation uh, or with uh, either international organizations or uh, other countries. Uh, from this approach, we are clearly taking a quite different uh, road, a road which is going to be much more committed to working with other countries, with other groups, uh, to make progress on the critical uh, foreign policy issues that we face. Now, in the uh, brief uh, period that we've been here, Friday evening with uh, Brent Scowcroft and yesterday, we've heard a number of key issues. I just want to list for you 10 of these issues that I've heard discussed here in the past uh, couple of days. We've heard about Iraq. We've heard about the Afghan-Pakistan problem, about North Korea, about Iran about the uh, challenges of dealing with Russia at a period of time when the uh, strategic arms uh, agreement with Russia is going to expire in 2010. We've heard about China, the Middle East peace process, climate change, counterterrorism, counterproliferation. That's 10. I haven't mentioned global poverty. I haven't mentioned drugs. I haven't mentioned Latin America. I haven't mentioned the Atlantic Council. But these top 10 have, I think, occupied most of the comments that we've heard. I'd like to begin with my first comment, which is to appreciate that each of these problems is enormously complex and that progress requires a tremendous amount of uh, uh, application of resources uh, on each one of those 10. Most importantly, to make progress, it will require engagement and leadership by the President of the United States, whose time is limited and where there are many demands on that individual and his uh, close staff's uh, uh, issues that they must uh, address. It will require the energies and the application of our diplomatic uh, and other uh, resources for foreign policy to be uh, applied to all 10 of these. And it will also uh, require application of the budget dollars of the United States. Uh, I want to remind you that when I began uh, my uh, first year in the Office of Secretary of Defense in 1962, the uh, uh, President Kennedy made a tremendous effort to hold the entire budget of the country, the United States budget, to under $100 billion, and therefore in 1962, required the Defense Department to spend only $40 billion. In 1993, when I was Deputy Secretary, 1995, when I was Deputy Secretary of Defense, I had to struggle to make ends meet with $345 billion. Today, the budget of the Department of Defense, including supplementals, is $700 billion. 
Now, these used to be large numbers until the financial crisis. But let me tell you that our nation, and I, I, uh, my, my wife Pat showed me the right-hand column of the New York Times today saying, in fact, there's going to be a need to reduce government expenditures at the same time that we try and uh, perform a stimulus for uh, our economy. But these are very serious resource numbers, and if you're going to, uh, going to uh, address all 10 of these significant issues, it is going to be very hard to do so with expending presidential leadership, our foreign policy instruments, and dollars. So I urge you, first, I note that the President of the United States will have to be very selective about which of these problems he actually addresses. And I urge you to have modest expectations about how much progress there will be. There is so much to be done, but there is so little time and so little resources. My second point about this list of 10 uh, urgent uh, security issues is, say, is, is the following. Making progress is more than just saying we are going to engage the other side of an issue in an international uh, uh, way. It's got to have more content than just saying engagement. What does engagement mean? I choose one of those 10 examples of foreign policy issues to address, and that is Iran. How can one make progress with Iran? Certainly an important matter to consider, certainly an important country to change the approach of the United States. Well, there you have four issues with Iran that must be considered simultaneously. First and most importantly, in my judgment, is Iran's continuing move to acquire nuclear weapons. Second is Iran's practice of encouraging involvement in Iraq. For example, by providing sanctuaries for those, some of those making improvised explosive devices which are used against our American servicemen and women in Iraq. Third, Iran has many activities and is an important force in Afghanistan. And fourth, Iran produces three million barrels of oil per day, which it offers on the world oil markets. And this oil is tremendously important to our close allies and indeed to uh, the supply of oil uh, for everyone in the world. So in order to make progress on the issue of Iran, it's not just engagement. It's not just chatting with them. One must have a serious set of instruments ready to bring to bear on the issue. How do you think about that? Well, let me give you just three uh, uh, points. The first and most important point is before entering into such an engagement, one has to have a clear picture of what U.S. interests are. I gave you four different objectives. Each one of them has, should have a different priority for the United States, but we should be clear in each one what our interests are. Second, before entering into such an engagement, one wants to have a precise sense of what are the incentives and the disincentives that can be brought to bear in the discussions. If you like, what are the carrots and sticks? How can we encourage Iran to work with the United States and other uh, nations of similar viewpoint? Or how can one say that if you don't work with us, matters will not be as easy for you economically or diplomatically? So the dialogue has to have specific uh, items to it. Third, the, con the focus of who you work with, the other countries, should be countries in the region. That point has been made by others in this conference. It's important to remember. Countries in the region care about their neighborhood, and when we involve ourselves, we should put them prominently uh, at our sides. And finally, let me say, that we have in each of such instances, like in the case of Iran, a balance of interests. We have these four interests that I mentioned to you, and there will be in the negotiation, even if, if it is successful, by no means certain, a balance of interests, which means that there will be compromise, and we should not expect that the outcome will be identically in our favor in all four of the items that I've mentioned, Afghanistan, Iraq, nuclear weapons, and oil. So you have to be prepared to have the outcome a little bit more complicated than uh, one would like. 
So this issue about clarity of objective and being clear about what you have to offer in a negotiation and an engagement is terribly important, and it applies to the other uh, 10 critical foreign policy issues that I summarized for you. For example, global warming. It's going to require more than just chatting with the Chinese and the Indians to convince them about the pace at which they will reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, especially CO2, carbon dioxide. I recall that the recall for you that the uh, Chinese are building about one large-scale coal plant every week, and uh, that that is projected to continue. Uh, so there will be a need to bring to the table more than just engagement and talk. There will need to be specific, it is yet to be quite unclear, provisions about how to come to yes with the large emerging economies uh, who are uh, projected to uh, 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 emit uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the future. Let me give you my third point about these, how to engage uh, these foreign policy issues. And this concerns the question about do we have realistic objectives when we engage ourselves in these countries? And here I would like to use the example which has been much discussed here in this conference, and I note will be discussed in the Camden Conference next year. I fear that the subject of Afghanistan and Pakistan will still be timely next year. Uh, but let me just take this as an example about the real, real realism of our objectives. What was our original objective when we went into Afghanistan in 2001? It was quite clear and very simple. One was to capture Osama bin Laden, destroy the al-Qaeda organization that was present in Afghanistan, and to punish the Taliban government for having given sanctuary to al-Qaeda. It was a very simple objective to state. <coughs> now, it turns out that Congress requires every quarter for uh, the uh, Department of Defense to uh, put forward what its objectives are in uh, Afghanistan. And the most recent publication of a rather extensive and quite interesting report about what the objectives are and how well we are doing uh, in achieving those objectives uh, was published just this month, 2009, here in January, uh, for the Congress. And I will tell you that that objective has shifted dramatically. And you've heard that in some of the discussion. The objective now is that we have to transform the society and country of Afghanistan in order to provide it with a secure country, with a politically stable leadership, and with a social order where there is economic and social advancement throughout the country. It's a very different objective. And so I ask you, is this an objective which we should have adopted, or more importantly, more importantly than that, is it certainly a, a laudable goal, a laudable goal to, to try and transform Afghanistan? The question is, is this goal achievable? There are several aspects to consider in that question. The first and the uh, most important is, do the people of Afghanistan want a different society? You say maybe they should want a different society, Maybe they should want a Jeffersonian democracy, <laughs> uh, but it is a uh, bridge quite a long distance away. And the fact is a lack of respect and tolerance for a widely different society is something that should be somewhere in the consideration of our uh, programs. It's not obvious that one can immediately have other people adopt what we know to be uh, a better way of life. The second is, if you are going to engage in such nation building, you have to ask, does the United States have the instruments to bring to bear in that in order to achieve the objective of changing for the better that particular society? Well, the first piece of this is our military force. Let me just guarantee to you that our U.S. military, with their fantastically capable and uh, really dedicated professional men and women are able to achieve military objectives. 
They bring to bear overwhelming military force. They do it rapidly. They do it with a surprisingly small amount of collateral damage. And they achieve the conquest of whether it's Iraq, whether it's in Bosnia. Uh, they achieve their military objectives quite promptly. But then what happens? Then what happens if you plan to be in this country for a long time, I was, by now I assume five or six years in Iraq, we're more than that, of course, with a smaller presence for the U.S. and NATO in uh, the Balkans. But you now have to be able to bring to bear a whole series of other instruments. You have to bring to bear the elements of civil government. You care about water, power, health, sanitation. You care about the rule of law. You care about uh, economic development. Now, I must say to you that the United States has a very bad record of bringing those elements to bear in these countries where we are trying to change uh, the uh, uh, nation. We have not found a way to bring sufficient resources from the Department of Justice for police or law, from AID, from the Department of State, to really influence that subsequent step of nation building in which we so often seem to be uh, uh, taking a step towards. And then you can ask the question, is Afghanistan as a country with its actual history, centuries of history, really able to make this transition? So I took a look at the CIA fact book on Afghanistan. That's not an oxymoron, I will tell you. It's quite. <laughs> And I, I'm informed that the uh, gross domestic product of uh, Afghanistan is $6 billion. I'm sorry, $8 billion. That its biggest uh, source of, is, of, of that GDP is agriculture, and that, of course, the biggest crop is opium. So that, uh, that is the uh, economic base which that country has to work with. Uh, I might point out that we spend our presence in Afghanistan is now about $40 billion a year, uh, 30,000 troops going up plus 17 by President Obama. We spent $150 billion a year in Iraq. But uh, of that 40, so uh, Afghanistan has eight GDP total. Uh, the estimates in the report of uh, uh, security in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, says that uh, Afghanistan should have a national defense force of 60,000 members and a national police force of 80,000 members. <coughs> when you price that out, that's $3 billion out of the $8 billion. It is very, very dubious. It is not at all dubious. It's, certain, it's certainly wrong. It's impossible for uh, uh, Afghanistan to have the economic base to itself make this transition even over a very long period of time. So you will see that this 2010 conference will have much to discuss. The tendency of nation building is understandable in the United States. We've been practicing it in all sorts of administrations. During the first Clinton administration where I served, we were in Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, and Kosovo. President Bush took us into Iraq and Afghanistan. Now the question is, are we really able to do that well, and how much should we do it? I leave that for you to uh, ponder a bit, but let me just say that if you ask me, not only is it, in my mind, a dubious trend in U.S. foreign policy to enter into this nation building, but sometimes we miss completely. Let me say to you that if you ask me what is my greatest foreign policy, disappointment from my service in the Clinton administration was the fact that we did nothing about Rwanda. And by a very modest application of military force, not nation building, we could have, we could have easily prevented, easily prevented the deaths of hundreds of thousands of human beings far beyond the, the aggregate total of the lives which have been lost, let's say, in the Balkans and uh, in uh, Iraq. My final point about these uh, 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 foreign policy objectives is to remind you that every time we devote ourselves to one of them, 
there are opportunity costs from the application of our activities in one of these areas. There are things that we bear as a cost because we are pursuing one of these objectives. Well, the example of Afghanistan still is pertinent here, where by our presence in Afghanistan, as is now clear but not intended in our initial uh, uh, deployment in the region, is the destabilization that is occurring in Pakistan. And indeed, today it is completely usual to refer to this issue as a Afghan Pak problem. Because of the movement of the Taliban across the uh, very, very dangerous frontier between Pakistan and Afghanistan, the Fatah territories, the Northwest territories, we have found it progressively necessary to pursue the Taliban there and as a result to create difficulties for the Pakistani military, for the Pakistani intelligence service, a very active part of that country, and to really politically destabilize Pakistan to the point where Pakistan sees itself as being pressured by the United States. Pakistan sees itself as the United States allowing India and indeed Iran even to uh, make difficulties in their uh, uh, frontier areas. And our involvement in Afghanistan creates a cost for Pakistan. And as one of our uh, questioners last yesterday from, I believe, Portland, from Belfast, Mr. Block said, wouldn't it be better to focus on stabilizing Pakistan as opposed to fighting the Taliban? Why are we fighting the Taliban? Why are we opposed to the Taliban? There's really only one reason. We don't want them to be a source of terrorism to strike at us, the United States, or at our allies. But by an extended presence in that country, we encourage the Taliban's activity in a terrorist way. And moreover, we attract to Afghanistan foreign fighters who will become terrorists elsewhere. It's not unlike the situation of the, ex of the opportunity costs we face by being in Iraq, where foreign, uh, 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 war foreign fighters are attracted to Iraq, making it much more a center of terrorism than it ever was before, or the opportunity cost that by being in Iraq, as we heard yesterday, you influence Arab public opinion in Cairo, in Damascus, in Jerusalem, and elsewhere. So the opportunity costs of pursuing any of these activities must be kept in mind. It's a very serious uh, uh, constraint on what we are doing. I know we're in the Camden uh, Opera House, and therefore I thought I would change to Act Two, something entirely <laughs> different, <coughs> uh, and make a few remarks about United States intelligence in our uh, capability to uh, contribute, the intelligence community's capability to contribute to United States foreign policy. And it's been properly stated here that we have, very, we have different uh, elements of our foreign policy. We have diplomacy, above all. We have our military posture. We have intelligence. And we also have trade and economic assistance. They're all important. But I want to just say that intelligence is especially important here and uh, has some uh, special challenges at this point. And I want to just mention very briefly, because I'm going to stay close to the time, to uh, give you a, a few uh, remarks about uh, our intelligence capacity, at least my judgment of it. Again, because I know there are uh, officers in the uh, CIA office, former CIA officers in the audience. I hope only former ones. Uh, and. Uh, 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 <laughs> And also to remind us, we all know this, intelligence uh, lies uh, uncomfortably in a democratic society. The society knows that intelligence is necessary, but it has to balance the tendency of a democratic society to be open and secret and legal uh, with the uh, necessities of uh, effective foreign intelligence. And at present, the intelligence community, particularly the CIA, is going to be at a complete stop 
until it resolves some very serious public issues uh, that uh, I think can be resolved, and I hope that the new director, Leon Panetta, working with the new director of national intelligence, Denny Blair, will uh, 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 solve quite promptly. And this has to do with the detention of bad people, with the methods of interrogation, with electronic surveillance on the U.S., uh, with, on U.S. entities, <coughs> and with renditions of bad people to uh, other countries. Each of these issues uh, uh, is, each, each of these topics has very difficult aspects to it and very great tensions between uh, democratic and legal process and the necessities of uh, intelligence. Now, my experience has been uh, that these activities are both needed and that they can be managed in a way that the public will support and which has a, 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 a significant amount of uh, extra, uh, extra intelligence oversight. I found the Bush administration was more interested in fighting these issues than winning them. And they did so by really uh, insisting on executive branch prerogatives, in absence of independent review. Now, I believe that there are promising approaches similar to the FISA Court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which governs the use of wiretaps against uh, U.S. entities. Uh, uh, by an independent but special court that that kind of a model could be used to review independently and carefully uh, activities which the agency uh, uh, must take with regard to these different uh, 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 detention and interrogation methods. Uh, and that would be an independent review that would be found adequate both by our uh, legislature, by our courts, and by the public for actions that need to take place. But you cannot expect to have an effective intelligence uh, service if these kinds of uh, uh, possibilities are not permitted, and you cannot expect for it to have the same amount of judicial review that is afforded to uh, U.S. citizens in all cases. So changing this is very, very important. I mean, the whole notion of why did you have Guantanamo in the first place? You had Guantanamo in the first place because of an inability to resolve this issue about how do you handle bad people who are not U.S. citizens and who uh, 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 need to be uh, retained uh, for the protection of, uh, of our country. So I'm very optimistic that this will be done, but it is absolutely necessary that we should be done. Let me also remind you that the uh, intelligence community suffered an enormous loss of credibility uh, with respect to the absence of weapons of mass destruction before our entry into Iraq uh, and uh, the uh, alleged, uh, the apparent failure uh, to uh, be able to warn, well, not apparent, the failure to successfully warn about the 9-11 attacks. Now, uh, how does a democracy re react to a situation where there's a failure in one of their organizations, such as the intelligence community in this particular case? We do so by reorganizing. Uh, reorganization uh, is uh, one of those matters which comfortably allows you to say you've made changes in progress when indeed little has happened. You know you're in trouble when the reorganization bill is 900 pages long. You know you're in trouble when it passes 99 to 1. <laughs> and it reminds me of a remark that my uh, friend James Rodney Schlesinger, a former director of Central Intelligence, and who was my boss in the Department of Energy in the 1970s, when I walked into his office with a complicated reorganization, I was undersecretary of the Department of Energy. He looked at me for, listened to me for two minutes, and he said, uh, different tree, same monkeys. And, uh, <laughs> I, I just want to assure you, I, John McGaffigan is not a monkey, but uh, that's. Uh, my, my, we have now uh, built a additional structure above the former intelligence structure with thousands of people in it, uh, so that uh, more time is being spent by sophisticated and talented intelligence officers inquiring about what each other is doing, rather than by pursuing. Uh, the job of intelligence in the United States. It is really 
uh, 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 in my mind, a very unfortunate situation where you've added more people, more people who can basically say no, and more a, hard, a larger fraction of the time is spent in Washington talking about intelligence than uh, collecting intelligence, distributing it, and informing senior policymakers. My final point has to do with uh, covert action, an important other function of the Central Intelligence Agency. And it's quite interesting. In the old days, the history is uh, uh, the CIA was always tried to uh, uh, change governments, overthrow governments, Latin America, wherever you want, Indonesia, wherever. Uh, but in fact, today, uh, the focus is quite different. There is the very, very successful uh, actions which the agency has taken to combat proliferation, combat terrorism, which I think uh, most Americans don't appreciate. Uh, the success here has been really quite considerable and, and they deserve our attention. But it is also the case that uh, much more activity is taking place uh, in these places like Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. I hope that the intelligence community, and I, and I suspect that under the leadership of uh, Admiral Blair and uh, Leon Panetta, that the, the agency will go back to playing its role in protecting the interests of Americans by gathering information, analyzing information, and informing our leaders so they are better able to carry out the uh, foreign policy obligations that lay so heavily on their shoulders. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>